pray. Father God, I just come before your throne this morning, and I ask that you would soften our hearts as we look at the story of Deborah. Lord, we thank you for what you have done and what you are doing here at Mariners, and we pray that we'll always stay focused on your kingdom. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, as Pastor Bill alluded to, every summer for the last three summers at Mariners, we do a Five Guys series, uh, which is really neat. Five guys who aren't normally up here, aren't Pastor Bill or Pastor Ron, have a chance to preach. And it's a lot of work if you've never done it, let me tell you. There's a lot that goes into it. Um, I'm excited to be one of the five guys this year. As Pastor Bill said, we're talking about women of the Bible. Last week, Pastor Dick gave us a great message on Mary Magdalene. Um, This week, we're going to look at the story of Deborah. So I would ask that you get your Bibles and turn to Judges chapter 4. That's where we will be here in just a few minutes. Um, But before we jump into Deborah, I want to talk about some of the most important women in my life. Um, The most important, the three most important people in my life are all women. And so it's awesome that we're talking about women of the Bible this summer because I get to talk about them. The first person that I want to introduce you to, this is my Aunt Shirley. Uh, My Aunt Shirley is the reason... I went to Southwest Baptist University. She's the reason that I wanted to go to school there. She uh, has taught me so much about hard work and dedication. She was the first person in our family to graduate from college. And so I knew in seventh grade where I was going to go to school. And it was because of her, because she went there and she spoke so highly of it. Um, The second person is my mom, Mitzi. Uh, My mom taught me a lot of things. But the thing that I remember most about mom growing up is that my younger brother, Andrew, and I, we're active. We were always doing something. And mom taught me about hard work and sacrifice. When I was in high school, my mom worked three jobs because she was trying to provide for Andrew and I. And I remember she never missed a game. And to this day, she's the only person I can't drown out in the crowd. I can drown everyone else out, not my mom. Uh, but she really taught me what sacrifice was all about. I remember there were times in high school when mom would be digging through the car to find $2 worth of change to put gas in the car, to take Andrew and I to baseball practice or our swim meet or whatever it was. And she never complained about it. And so I learned a lot from her, but I learned what sacrifice means. And uh, some of us may not understand that yet, but as you get older, you'll definitely understand everything your parents have done for you. Uh, The final person is my grandma, Mary, or as anyone who knows her calls her, grandma. Grandma taught me a lot of things. But Grandma, most importantly, she taught me how to be hospitable and how to be intentional with people. To this day, Grandma will FaceTime me two or three times a week. But when she does, she doesn't say, hey, Zach, how's it going? She says, hey, first thing she says, how's Pastor Bill? How's Ron? How's Dick? How are your friends in Maryland? How are your friends at home? And I'm like, Grandma, what about me? Like, hello? And then finally, after she has has gone through everyone else in my life, she will ask about me. And... I think that's why I'm intentional with people, and that's why when I come up to you and I say, hey, how are you doing? I want to know how you're doing. I want to know what's going on in your life, Uh, and I thank my grandma for that. She uh, taught me that. She's so intentional with people, and uh, once you meet her, like, she's in. Uh, So that is awesome. So as we turn to Judges chapter 4 today, we're going to learn about Deborah. Uh, And Deborah has a great story, but her story is also told with a couple of other key characters that we'll dive into Um, Deborah was the only female judge in the book of Judges. She was also a prophetess. Her time to judge came after Ewid had died and the Israelites were not seeking the Lord. Her story is found in Judges 4 and then Judges 5 is kind of her victory song. We're going to focus on Judges 4 today, uh, but I would encourage you to read Judges 5 this week and see her victory song. As we look at Deborah, I want to look at her story and how we can apply it to our lives today and how we can do this. Uh, And Deborah's story is all about leadership. And when I think of leadership, I think of something Sam Walton said, and for those of you who don't know who that is, he's the guy who created Walmart. Um, He said this on leaders. Outstanding leaders go out of their way to boost the self-esteem of their personnel. If people believe in themselves, it is amazing what they can accomplish. Uh, which is so true. I'm sure we've all had different bosses and leaders in our life that have pushed us to be better because of how they work and how, how, they, how they wanted us to work. Uh, before we read Judges 4, verse 1, what is a judge? There are different types, types of judges in the book of Judges. For instance, you have redeemers like Gideon in Judges chapter 6. Great story if you've never read Gideon. 
uh, who saves Israelites from the Midianites. You have a provider of peace and rest. That's Uid and J.R. You have the powerful and probably the most famous judge, Samson, right? And you have leaders of the nation like Deborah. All right, now we're going to start with verse 1, and we're going to read verses 1, 2, and 3. Then the sons of Israel did again did evil in the sight of the Lord after you had died. And the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazar, and the commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth Hergium. The sons of Israel cried out to the Lord, for he had 900 iron chariots, and he oppressed the sons of Israel severely for 20 years. As we read through Judges, and if you, if you read through the book of Judges, they are in a cycle, and that cycle is um, the cycle of sin. It starts with sin, which is our first S on your blanks, on your, um, on your handouts. Uh, it starts with sin, and if you get sin, then you get into servitude, and you fall victim to a king or to an army. Um, like in our story here, the Israelites were um, being punished by Jabin. Um, and after the servitude, the Israelites cry out to the Lord for supplication. And the supplication comes in the form of a judge. Um, Samson, Gideon, or as we're going to talk about today in our story, a woman named Deborah. And they cry out to the Lord. And the Lord, with the supplication, gives them salvation with the judge. And the judge comes and helps them through their time of period. And then after the salvation is silence. And silence is where they fall into trouble again because God is not speaking to them. The cycle in the book of Judges occurs seven times over about a 400-year period in the book of Judges. Now, I know what you're thinking. Man, that sounds like something Pastor Bill would say because it's all S's. It is. Pastor Bill gave me that. Thank you, Pastor Bill, for that great illustration um, on the book of Deborah and, and the cycle that we are going to see here. In the time of Deborah, the Canaanites were still in Jerusalem, but they were trying to refocus and regroup. And in verse 2, the Lord had sold the Israelites into the hands of Jabin, who was king of Canaan. It took the Israelites 20 years to cry out for help. How many of us wait for the last possible minute to cry out for help? Something we talked about this morning in our ABF class is that the reason it might have taken 20 years is because that was maybe a generation it took, you know, the first generation was used to it, and then finally the next generation came around, and they're like, all right, this isn't right. We need Jesus. So they called out to him for help. But if you look at your own life, we see that too. For me, when I'm in the Word, when I am studying and journaling every day, my anxieties are minimum. But when I'm not, I get anxious about everything in life. And that's just such an easy reminder to me is, is that everything we do should be focused right here on this book. Um, and it should come, our actions, our thoughts, our words should come right here from this book. When we look at loss, when we look at people who lose stuff and, and have anxiety, I think about Job. And the book of Job is a great story. This guy, Job, had everything, and he lost everything. But through it all, he never cursed the Lord. He, he got upset with every single other part of his life, but never did he curse the Lord. What a great example for us that no matter how hard life might be, Jesus is still there with us. and We don't need to get upset with him. Um, and I love what he tells Job. He's like, were you there when I created the earth? No, <laughs> I wasn't. All right then, you don't know what's going on. Let me handle it. Right? And we don't understand that sometimes because we try to do it ourselves. Verses 2 and 3, the Israelites finally seek out the Lord. And they finally say, look God, we need you. Jabin's army had 900 iron chariots. So to put that in perspective, that would be like a tank in our time. So Jabin's army had 900 tanks. Let's continue reading in verse 4 to see what's going on uh, in this story. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She used to sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim, and the sons of Israel came up to her for judgment. Hang on right there. Now this is not her palm tree, if you're wondering. If you flip back to Genesis 35, verse 8, the palm tree is actually planted 
for Deborah, who was Rebekah's nurse. And Rebekah, of course, was the wife of Isaac. Uh, it says in Genesis 35, verse 8, Now Deborah, Rebekah's nurse, died, and she was buried there below the Bethel under the oak. Different translations, oak, palm tree, same tree, but I think it's interesting that she sits under a tree named after her um, when she is judging the Israelites. All right, continuing with verse 6. Now she sent and summoned Barak, the son of Abinoam, from Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Behold, the Lord, the God of Israel, has commanded, Go and march to Mount Tabor, and take with you 10,000 men from the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulon. I will draw out to you Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his many troops to the river Kishon, and I will give him into your hand. Then Barak said to her, If you go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. How many times in our lives do we, we think we know what God's got planned, but we can't step out in our own faith? Like Barak. Barak knew what he had to do, but his faith in the Lord wasn't big enough. So he turned to Deborah, and he trusted in her faith in the Lord so that he could do what he was called out to do. Now I think this is really important. Um, let's look at how Deborah responds to him. Because remember, she's the leader of all of Israel right now. So it's very easy for her to say, Brock, do it, right? Let's see how she responds. Verse 9. She said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the honor shall not be yours on the journey that you are about to take. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hands of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went back with Barak to Kadesh. Barak called Zebulon and Naphtali together to Kadesh, and 10,000 men went up with him. Deborah also went with him. Man, I love that about Deborah. Even though she is the leader, she's the boss, she's willing to step down and do whatever it takes to complete it. Um, I think about when I worked at Walmart, I had two very different managers. One manager would walk around every morning. He knew our names. If it got busy, he was the first person to jump on a cash register. Our other manager sat in the back in his office all day. Which one do you think I worked harder for? The first one, right? And that's how Deborah was for Barack. You know, she very easily could have said, no, I'm not doing this. You go. But instead she said, okay, I will go with you. And that stands out to me because Jesus sends people out in pairs, right? Luke chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Now, after the Lord appointed 70 others and sent them in pairs ahead of him to every city where he himself was going to come, and he was saying to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, beseech the Lord of the harvest and send laborers into his harvest. You know, I think about Pastor Bill's sermon last fall where he talks about Matthew 9.38, where we uh, pray for workers, right? And Jesus sends out people together in pairs. And it's so important. There are strength in numbers. You know, we can do a lot of things by ourselves, but when we have someone with us, it's way easier. You think about people who work out, and those of you who work out, I commend you because I have no motivation to do that. I'm going to be happy, and working out does not make me happy. But if you think about working out, if you think about working out, if you do it by yourself, you can do it for a week, maybe two, right? But if you've got someone with you, you're going to do it with them, right? And it's the same way if you think about reading your Bible. If you struggle reading your Bible, get some friends. Get someone close to you and say, hey, let's do a study together. Because then they're going to hold you accountable and you're going to hold them accountable, right? And that's what Deborah was doing for Barack. Barack was a little scared, but he was able to do it. I also think about Charlie Brown. You guys know Charlie Brown? Well, Lucy in Charlie Brown has a great analogy for sticking together. She says, separated, we are weak, but together, we are strong. What a great image, right? Separated, we are weak, but together, we are strong. And we see that in this story. Barack was weak on his own, but with Deborah, he was able to, to complete what God was asking him to do. In verse 8, Deborah tells Barak that he's not going to get the credit for defeating Sisera, but that credit will go to a woman. Now, if you've never read this story, automatically you think Deborah's going to get the credit. Not so fast. 
Let's, um, we'll, we'll get there in a minute, but Deborah's not the person who's going to get credit. Um, I think there's a great lesson here for us to learn this morning. Um, sometimes we need to just step back and look at the bigger picture. Um, when I was in school at Southwest Baptist University at SBU, I worked in the athletics department. I loved it. I was behind the scenes. I got to do all kinds of fun stuff. But every, every day, we would have something going on. And my boss, he was the sports information director. So in the spring, we would have up to 10 games a day that we would have to do stats for. We'd have to do scoreboard, you know, video, write stories. And there was just the two of us. So it was a lot. But when you go to a game, you know, if you go to a Navy football game in the fall, you're not thinking, all right, what are the stats? Okay, why isn't the scoreboard working? You're thinking about one thing. I hope Navy wins, right? Um, <laughs> thank you, Pastor Bill, for that amen. Uh, but we don't, we don't think about all the stuff that goes into the preparation. You think about Sunday mornings. Take your insert that we have here, and, and you look at all the stuff on this from the prayers every day, which are awesome. Um, just to pray along, know that we're praying with each other. Um, and you look at the inside, you know, setting all of this up. Sarah Cochran does that. She's in the back. Okay, I'm going to embarrass her a little bit. That's okay. Amen. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Uh, Sarah does all of this every week. But she doesn't do it to say, hey, look at me, right? She does it because it's an important part of our church service on Sunday, of our worship service. Think about all the people who do our audio and our visual. We don't notice them, right, until the screen's not working or the mic's not working, and then we're like, okay, who's back there today, right? But without these people, we don't have our worship service. It's not complete. So, Sarah, guys and girls in the back, thank you for what you do every week um, to help our worship service flow the way that it should flow. Uh, but let's look at Barack. He doesn't get the credit, right? God says you're not going to get the credit, and that's because... He lacked the faith. God told him to do something, and he couldn't do it. He, he had to have help, right? The Lord asked him to step up. He couldn't step up. Many times in life, we don't step up. Uh, and I know in my personal life, there have been lots of times when God has said, Zach, you need to do this. And I'm like, mm, maybe. And I don't do it. And, you know, one of the biggest ones for me, when I was a freshman at SBU, I was a youth ministry major. And I let Satan tell me, you're never going to be good enough to be a youth pastor. So I changed my major to sports management, right? Easiest major ever. Those of you who have not gone to college yet, sports management is cake, right? But I did that because I was scared. And I knew since I was 13 what the Lord had called me to do, and it was work with students. And after 10 years of running from the Lord and not having enough faith that I could do it, I finally just said, God, I'm done running from you. I'm going to run to you. And when I did that, within four months, I was moving 1,100 miles across the country and living on an island and working with all the kids in the back. So um, when, we, when we put our faith in Jesus, we're going to see results. Um, and it may not be something as dramatic as moving 1,100 miles across the country, but when you, when you step back and you say, Lord, you do it, it's amazing what is going to happen in your life. All right. What an important moment in the story for Deborah as she calls Barack out. She tells him that this is the day that the Lord has told you to go and to, to defeat Sisera, right? But what I love about in that verse, verse 14, she says, the Lord has gone before you. What an awesome thing. The Lord goes before us. And sometimes it's 10 years of, of wrestling with what God's telling you to do with your life. Sometimes it's a career change or, you know, uh, an example someone gave in our AVF class this morning, sometimes you get married and you're in Europe, right? I, I don't know about that. Uh, but we have to know that the Lord has gone before us and not just like a little ways before. God, God doesn't stand in our realm of time, right? So when we're worried about time, God's like, it's okay, I've got this, right? And we just have to trust in him, and we have to follow in him. Verse 17, as we go back um, to Judges chapter 4. Now Sisera fled away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Habar the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin, king of Hazar, and the house of Habar the Kenite. 
Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn aside, my master. Turn aside to me. Do not be afraid. And he turned aside to her and into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. He said to her, Please give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. So she opened a bottle of milk and gave him a drink, and then she covered him. He said to her, Stand in the doorway of the tent, and it shall be if anyone comes and inquires of you and says, Is anyone here? You will say, No. I find it interesting that Sisera was willing to go into Habar's tent without him being there, because in that day and age, and this is still good practice today, don't go into someone's house if there's not someone else present, right? Uh, it's just like in the children's ministry. We don't let our volunteers go one-on-one -on -one with the kids, right? We have either two volunteers or a kid or two kids and a volunteer, you know, and, and Cicero was so, he was so willing to hide. He's like, yeah, I'll just go in. We're friends. Um, but what's interesting is that in that day and time, women weren't allowed to go in to, or men weren't allowed to be in a place with a woman unless there was a man present, right? But what's also important about this story is that in that day and age, women were the ones who, who pitched the tents, which makes the next part very interesting. Verses 21 and 22. But Jael, Habar's wife, took a tent peg, seized a hammer in her hand, and went secretly to him and drove the peg into his temple. And it went through into the ground, for he was sound asleep and exhausted. So he died. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man who you are seeking. And he entered with her, and behold, Sisera was lying dead before the tent peg in his temple. Now what's interesting about this is that Jael was a friend of Sisera. They were friends, but yet Jael realized that he was an enemy of the Lord. So she took it into her own hands and finished him. Um, I really wanted to get a tent peg and a watermelon and have an illustration this morning, but I didn't want Pastor Bill to faint uh, in the back of the sanctuary, so I didn't do that. Uh, we don't need that. Um, but what, what an illustration. Like, first of all, Sisera asks for water, and Jael gives him milk, and she takes care of him, and he thinks, all right, I'm good, I'm safe. But then she, she turns, <laughs> and, and what I love about this is that she has to know the consequences. Her husband's going to come home and see his friend is dead in their house, in their tent, but she doesn't care. She sees the Lord's plan, and so instead of focusing on her life, she's focused on the Lord, and I think that is just something that we can all focus on, you know. Sometimes we're going to lose friendships over the Lord, and you know what? That's okay. Um, if we really are trusting in the Lord, we're going to ruffle some feathers, and that's okay. Um, I think it's a great thing, though. Good leaders have good followers, and they have good people with them. If you look at King David, he had 37 mighty men that he, that, you know, were his most trusted men. And one of those guys, one of my favorite guys in the Bible, a guy named Benaiah. Now, Benaiah, if you don't know the story, one day he chased a lion into a pit on a snowy day, and he killed it, right? I'm not going to be chasing any lions anytime soon. But he, he chased a lion into this pit, and that decision helped propel him to be the leader of Israel's army. Right, So David had good men beside him. After, after the, the battle is over, and this is what chapter 5 is all about. This Chapter 5 is all about the victory song that Deborah and Barak sing. Um, chapter 5, verse 3 says this. Hear, O kings, give ear. O rulers, I to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. Um, how great is it that after they defeated Sisera and they defeated the army, they praised the Lord? Uh, how many of us, when, we, when the Lord does something in our lives, how many of us praise him? How many of us forget and we just kind of slack back like the Israelites did? We just let it go. I just think it's so important that they, you know, they're, they're praising God for getting them through this war. Um, we've all had different wars in our life in different valleys. And, um, you know, some of you might feel like you're in a valley right now. Well, here's some good news. Jesus wants to walk with us in that valley. He's not waiting at the top saying, come on, you're almost here. 
No, no, no. Jesus is going to be dirty with us, right? And that's the great thing about Jesus is he doesn't want to wait for us. He wants to be there with us, right? He wants to walk with us as we're struggling. He wants to walk with us when we feel like we're on top of the world. Um, As we look at Deborah's story about leadership, I just think there are things that we can apply to our lives from her story. The first thing that we can apply about leadership to our lives is to be available. Uh, Let me say that again. Be available. Deborah was available first to the Lord, but then also to Barak. Good leaders make time for the Lord, and they also make time for their people. All of us have had bosses, you know, who may not have been around or who were awesome. I think about my professor at SBU. His name's Duke Jones, Dr. Jones. Uh, Last April, uh, right at Easter, I called him, and it was during finals week at SBU, and I got his voicemail, and he called me back, and he said, Zach, he's like, I'm swamped. He's like, but I've got time for you. He's like, what's going on? And I, um, many of you, we've talked about Riley. Um, You know, that was the time that he got diagnosed with cancer, was right at Easter, and that just broke my heart because he's the same age as my nephew, and so it really hit home for me, and so I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to be there or what to do, so I called Dr. Jones, and I was like, what do I do? How do I, how do I cope with this? And he said, just treat him the same as you would. He's like, just be you. He's like, don't make it different. But the, the important thing to me is that he was available. He could have very easily said, Zach, let me call you back next week after finals are over. But he took that time out of his day to say, I'm here for you. And I think that's what Deborah did. She very easily could have said, no, Brock, I told you what to do. Go do it. But instead, she was available to him. And she, she was what Barack needed to finish the mission, right? Which is important. The second thing uh, that Deborah shows us is to be a servant leader. And I know I've talked about my college a lot today, but our mission statement at SBU says, Southwest Baptist University is a Christ-centered, caring, academic community preparing students to be servant leaders in a global society. Uh, much like Deborah, we have to take time. You know, if we're at the top, we have to be able to do everything. I think about uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Jesus, for the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, to give his life as a ransom for many. In John 13, 5, this is at the Last Supper. Jesus lowers himself to that of a servant, and he washes the disciples' feet. John 13, 5. Then he poured the water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel which he was girded. These are just a couple of examples of how Jesus shows us what it means to be a servant leader. Um, Many of you know, when I was in college, I had the opportunity to work at Disney World. And I bring that up because when Walt Disney was alive, he would walk around the park and pick up trash. Okay, if the guy who founded the happiest place on earth can pick up trash, so can I, right? That was just an example of great leadership. The final thing is to be bold. Leaders are chosen by God and by his standards, not by our standards. When we read through the Bible, it's full of stories of people who should never be leaders, but God sees other things in them. Um, David was a shepherd. He was the youngest of all of his brothers. Paul was a guy who persecuted Christians on the regular, and yet today he's probably the most known apostle, right? When I think about someone being bold, I think about Tim Tebow. Do you guys know who that is? Tim Tebow was a college quarterback at the University of Florida. Uh, And on January 8, 2009, he was playing for the national championship in football. And that season, on his eye black, he had been writing Philippians 4.13, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But Tim was like, he felt God telling him to be bold and to change his his eye black. And so he changed it before the game to John 3.16. Two days after the game, he was having lunch with his head coach, Urban Meyer. And Urban told him, 94 million people Googled John 3.16 that night. It gets better. (laughs) The story gets better, as I've got goosebumps. Three years later to the day, and this is the one and only time I've ever rooted for the Denver Broncos. I am sorry, Kopkas, but you're not going to like this story. They're playing the Pittsburgh Steelers in a playoff game. All right, so Denver wins the game. Tim's going to do his press conference after the game, and one of the Broncos' public relations guys stops him and says, Tim, 
you don't understand what happened tonight. You threw the ball for 316 yards. Your yards per rush, 3.16. Your yards per completion, 31.6. Time of possession, 31.06. Are you catching a theme here? And the ratings for that night, 31.6. During the game, 90 million people Googled John 3.16. It was the number one thing trending on social media that night. And I think it's awesome because one guy took a stand and he was bold. And with that, 184 million people Googled John 3.16. And I think we can reach people in our life, but we have to trust the Lord and we have to have faith in Him. Um, before we pray, I want to show you an email I got last Sunday from a nine-year-old in our church. This is from Sierra. Sierra sent me this email last week. You can't read it. It's kind of blurry. That's okay. But it says, it says, Pastor Zach, every time I go to Baltimore, D.C., I see homeless people, and it makes me so sad. How can I help them? Uh, I want to help them. I want to make, she calls them blessing bags. And this isn't just, oh, hey, let's go do something. Since that time, I have another email. She wants to, she's got a list of everything she wants to put in the blessing bags. She's got a list of letters of encouragement she wants to write on the blessing bags. And what a, what a lesson for the rest of us. She is nine years old. She sees a need, and she wants to step up and take care of it. How many times do we see a need, and we, re, we don't step up? We fail to step up. Um, I hope that, and I know you really can't read it, but it's okay. I hope that encourages you, because it really has encouraged me this week that we can make a difference. Um, and Sierra's heart is on fire to help people in need. Um, you should ask her about it. She, she wanted to come in today, and then she decided she was going to go to children's ministry. But she said, you know, Pastor Zach, can you please talk about it? Yeah, like, this is awesome. This is something that directly applies to all of us. Like, how can we help our neighbor? Um, so we're going to pray. Um, Alex and praise team, you guys can come back up. Uh, but as we get ready to pray on your connection cards, I would encourage you to fill out your prayer request if you have one. Uh, once we get done praying, the worship team is going to um, sing the first verse by themselves, and then after the first verse, we'll all stand together. Uh, so let's pray, and then we're going to sing um, after that. Lord, we thank you for the best display of leadership in our lives. And I pray that we would turn our hearts to you and allow you to lead us. I pray that we would find our people who are in our corner and we would stand with them. Thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus to save us. Lord, I pray that, much like Sierra, we can find a heart for you. And when we see someone in need, we will be bold and we will step up uh, to meet their need. God, we love you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.